Okay. Yes. So, it is a pleasure to have with us today Andy Burkert. Most of you uh, know him. He is uh, the has the chair of uh, computational astrophysics at the University of Munich. You know his uh, many contributions to dynamical astronomy and galactic dynamics, uh, cosmology, galaxy formation, all that stuff. And uh, as you have been uh, already informed, the title you can already see on the screen. Uh, it talks about the structure of high redshift disk galaxies, an extremely hot subject. And uh, okay, uh, you may interrupt for clarifications. Questions will be at uh, the end of uh, the talk for the discussion. And uh, as you know, uh, with uh, Andy, we're organizing this HERA24 meeting for next September. And I'm very glad here that uh, Andy is here, uh, Leah is here, and I know if I and I other from the probably Albert is also following. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And if uh, other people from uh, uh, the speakers of September are around, so uh, let's uh, hope for next. Uh, we have some technical problem. Well, okay. Okay. This I will take care. Okay, so Andy, you may start. Uh, okay. We are listening here. Thank you, Pano, for the invitation and the nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to tell you a little bit about work that is going on in collaboration with Reinhard Genzel and uh, his group from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Uh, we are, this is Manuel Behrendt, uh, Mark Schartmann, Lea Remus, Klaus Dulak on Arleiteklu and so on, are located at the University Observatory, but we have this kind of, I yeah, have a joint, uh, so to say, um, uh, position also at MPE, and we work closely together with Reinhardt okay. on uh, the observations of high redshift galaxies. And I would like to motivate this with what you all know, the Hubble sequence, which kind of summarizes the structures of galaxies. And as you know, there are two types. They are the early type, elliptical galaxies, spheroidal ones, and then there are the disk galaxies. And uh, as you know, the early types are burned out. The sense of star formation has stopped, while star formation still continues in the disk galaxies because they contain cold gas that can turn into stars. Now, when you go to higher redshift, the question arises, do you see the same type of sequence as we see at redshift zero? Or when was the Hubble sequence established? And that is something we wanted to understand with Reinhardt by looking at higher redshift galaxies. And it turns out, as you will see, that when you go to higher redshift, it's more complicated. You don't find thin disks anymore, uh, which uh, are completely dominated by rotation. Um, and you, you see galaxies that have a high dispersion, but are still forming stars. So it's almost like an elliptical, but a star forming type of elliptical, so to say. And that is what I would like to discuss. And one might place these galaxies. Here you see one of the images you will see later on. Maybe in this regime of a zero galaxies, uh, with the exception that a zero galaxies nowadays are burned out, while these galaxies here form stars like crazy. Now, I would like to focus on redshift two, cosmological redshift two. And the reason for this is that this is the peak of star formation. Here you see the cosmic star formation rate as function of cosmic redshift. And it peaks at redshift two, three giga years after the Big Bang. This is the time where most of the stars were created. It's the time where the morphology of galaxies was set. And by that also the Hubble time. And there have been now substantial observations by Reinhard Genzel and other groups of the galaxy structure at this redshift. Some of them is understandable, but others are a puzzle. And I will like to mention a couple of these puzzles. So to get you into the regime of high rate of redshift two, let's first start with redshift zero, this galaxy. This is a typical one, a beautiful one, where you see the spiral arms and then see the filigrane 
more uh, morphological structure of the interstellar medium, um, and it's a fast rotating thin galaxy. And uh, Pano and uh, Contopoulos and Leah have done a great deal on understanding the orbital structure of these type of galaxies. So I think we understand the origin of spiral arms, um, and we understand a lot of how bulges and bars are forming. They are puzzles with this, but I don't want to go on into this in greater details. I want, however, to ask the question, and that is something I, we might want to discuss at some point, whether what has been found out with respect to orbital structure and characterization for low redshift galaxies can also be applied to high redshift galaxies, which, as you will see, look quite different. Now, here is a high redshift counterpart. It's a normal star-forming disk galaxy, but not nearby. Instead, it's far, far away at redshift 2. And when you look at it, it looks completely different to the low redshift case. You see a ring of star formation. This is H alpha, so it traces the star forming gas. And you see these large clumps, which have typical sizes of kiloparsec. And uh, you might say, okay, maybe this is because of smoothing. You know, we do not have the high resolution there. The, a typical um, a resolution element is a few hundred parsecs. But even if you would smooth this galaxy to a few hundred parsecs, it wouldn't look like this galaxy over there. So the galaxies at Redshift 2 look different with respect to the Redshift 0 galaxies. Now, interestingly, with respect to global properties, they are very similar. Um, these galaxies have masses in stars of order 10 to 11, if you turn the 10, 10, 11 solar masses, they are fast rotating with rotation velocities of 100 to 300 kilometers a second. And the half light radius are typical, a few kiloparsecs. That's very similar to the low redshift counterpart. But when you look at star formation rates, they are very different. Whereas nearby star forming galaxies have rates of a few solar masses per year, a gas masses of a few 10 to 9 solar masses, the early type galaxy, the, the, the young galaxies have star formation rates that are factor 10 larger. And the gas mass is also a factor 10 larger. Now you might say, and this has been said quite often, that maybe these galaxies at high redshift are in the burst mode. They haven't yet figured out an equilibrium like we see in these low redshift galaxies. So all the gas which is around is bursting into stars. But the fascinating result is this is not the case. And that can be best demonstrated when looking at the so-called depletion time. The depletion time is a time scale on which the available gas turns into stars. So it's just simply the gas mass divided by the star formation rate. And the very puzzling result is when you go to current galaxies, they all have the same depletion time. It's always 10 to nine years, it takes 10 to nine years for the gas in a galaxy to turn into stars. But when you go to the high redshift galaxies, the depletion time is almost the same. Uh, it's five to the eight years, which is a factor two difference, and who cares about a factor two in astronomy? Can, can so, I ask a clarification yes. question? Yes, Andres, Andres. Sure. This, this depletion time assumes a constant, no feedback affected consumption of the gas by star formation, correct? Yeah, it's just simply the measurement. You take the observed gas and divide it by the star formation rate and because, because out feed, comes this, yes. Feedback uh, will uh, modify that. Yeah, it, it could very well have an effect, and I think it has an effect. Let me they have get this bar here. Um, but it, the measurements just simply show that, uh, that this ratio is very similar to present-day galaxies. And the interesting thing is you could imagine an depletion time, which is a few 10 to six years, simply because if you look at all the cold gas and the collapse time, it's a factor of thousand shorter. Yeah, That it is 10 to nine years for present day galaxies is as you correctly say, due to the feedback. The gas can't 
completely turn into stars quickly. The efficiency is only 0.1% in present day galaxies because of the feedback probably. But the interesting story, the efficiency is also 0.1% in these high redshift galaxies. So 0.2% is not very different. So also these galaxies, despite all the gas and uh, the very funny structure, uh, are as inefficient in forming stars as present day galaxies. And that to me tells us that these galaxies here are not in the burst mode of star formation, because if you would have a burst of star formation, then you get a runaway effect, and then everything turns into stars on a collapse time. And that's not the case. So feedback is clearly a re a re also important in these high redshift galaxies. Does that answer your question? Yes, partly. <laughs> partly? Well, if, well, if you have well, another wait question. For I wait for the end. That's all right. It's okay. okay. Yeah. I understand your main argument, though. Good. Okay. So um, there is a simple way to explain the star formation rates and the gas masses of these high redshift galaxies, and I would like to um, uh, introduce it, or for those who know it, just uh, uh, mention it again because I think it's so. Um, um, uh, how to say it's it, it's kind of. Um, simple that that everybody should know about it. It's called the cosmic bathtub model. And it is just simply assuming that mass is conserved. And it looks at the molecular gas mass in a galaxy and how it changes. The molecular gas mass increases by gas accretion from the cosmic rep, and it decreases because of star formation. So you have accretion and um, you turn the gas into stars with a certain rate. This is, of course, a time scale, that's the depletion time. Now, not all the gas goes into stars. A certain amount is replenished by stellar evolution through stellar winds. And, and, and basically, when a star turns into white dwarf, let's say 50% is uh, 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 blown out again. So this return fraction is R, is 0.5. And in addition, the galaxy also loses gas by a wind, galactic wind. And usually the, the wind rate is proportional to the star formation rate. And the mass loading of the wind, which is called alpha here, is of order one. That means one gram goes into stars and one gram is blown away. So this is 0.5, this is roughly one. If you put it together, then you get this very simple differential equation that the gas mass in a galaxy changes because of accretion minus three half the star formation rate. Now, the interesting part is that you have MH2 on the right side and you have MH2 on the left side. And you can demonstrate that this leads to a constant H2 mass very, very quickly on a time scale of about two to three depletion time scales. The MH2 over the T becomes zero. And what you then get is something which I always find surprising again. You find that the star formation rate, which is this ratio, is just simply two thirds the accretion rate. And this is amazing because it tells us that what we measure, measure as a rate of star formation in the galaxy is not at all linked to any physics within the galaxy. Note the physics of star formation and feedback and so on in this respect is hidden in the depletion time scale. The depletion time scale does not enter at all. The galaxy adjusts such that its star formation rate just mimics its accretion rate. And uh, for me, this is this is a boundary condition. So actually, cosmologists tell us how the star formation rate has to be. The other interesting point is, of course, you now can work out the total gas mass you need. The gas mass is the star formation rate times the depletion time. Remember, this is the star formation rate, and the star formation rate is the secretion. So the gas mass in the galaxy is simply the accretion rate times the depletion time scale. And that explains why galaxies are gas rich. They are not gas rich because they accrete, let's say, a lot of gas. They are gas rich because the depletion time scales are very long. They are not. 10 to 6 years, they are 10 to 9 years. And if you would have a depletion time, which is only a few 10 to 6 years, 
no galaxy would ever have a lot of gas. The gas mass would be small, independent of whether the galaxy is young or old. It doesn't really matter. So the fact we see gas in galaxies is because of this depletion time for, ever, for whatever reason being quite low. Now, you can apply this to the high redshift galaxies, of course. But that requires that we know the accretion rates. And uh, there has been nice papers about that. One of them is nice, then, and Dekel in 2008, who already worked out the redshift dependence of the accretion rate for a galaxy of a given dark matter mass. Our, our galaxies we are looking at here have typical masses of 10 to 12 solar masses. So if you, um, let's take this uh, for, uh, for a good starting point, then um, the accretion rate just goes as one over the redshift, one plus the redshift to power of 2.2. And that is true for any real mass if you compare two galaxies of the same real mass with different redshift. And you see, when we go to redshift two, the accretion rate predicted from cosmological simulations is a factor 10 larger than it is nowadays. The problem currently is we can't observe it. It's very, very hard to observe how much gas is being accreted onto a galaxy. You see the gas being blown out in winds very easily because it's hot, but the cold, maybe H1 type filamentary gas that falls into a galaxy is hard to trace. So we are basically relying here on a theory. Now, if you compare now the star formation rates, we said the star formation rate just is the accretion rate. Then because the accretion rate in a redshift two galaxies 10 times more, the star formation rate has to be 10 times more. And this is exactly what we observe. In the present day it's of order five and in redshift two it's of order 50. So nothing special about these galaxies. They do what every galaxy does right nowadays. The star formation rate is just larger because the accretion rate is larger. The gas mass as we worked out in the, in, in the past time model is the accretion rate times the depletion time. The depletion time, as we said, for whatever reason, is roughly the same. And therefore, the gas mass is also factor 10 larger in the high redshift galaxies than the present day galaxies. So it works perfectly. High redshift galaxies are gas rich and form stars with a high rate simply because they accrete 10 times faster uh, material than they do at low redshift. So, it's very, very easy to understand, but the big, big puzzle is this universal depletion time. Why does the gas turn into stars on time scale of 10 to nine years? What sets this time scale? You know, if you look at the galaxy, the galaxies are 10 to 10 years old, present day galaxies, and the internal collapse time scale is 10 to six years. No one would easily find a depletion time of 10 to nine years for present day galaxies. And for high redshift galaxies, it's even more complex and there's a lot of material in these galaxies. You would expect the depletion time could be much, much, much shorter, but it's again 10 to nine years. So what regulates it? What is the cosmic clock that details the galaxy on which time its gas should turn into stars? And I think this is the biggest puzzle we have currently in a galaxy evolution, uh, physics of the ISM. And as far as I know, there is no solution. We just but put it in. Yeah. A, a tiny clarification only. This is for the regular star forming galaxy because starbursts like Mercurian yes. to 3, Mark to 20, they are faster. They will yes. go to 10 to the 8 years. Absolutely right. And this is because they are highly perturbed. Yeah. I, I mean, of course, when the galaxy is perturbed, it's out of equilibrium. So it has to re refine its equilibrium again. But in equilibrium, somehow the depletion time scales are independent of redshift and galaxies. Yeah, in, in a dynamically minded audience here, I wanted to interject that to kind of put them in the bigger picture. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. You're, you're absolutely right. So this is, I think, a, a fundamental result. And uh, I, as I think one should now focus on understanding this. In, in greater details, because as you correctly say, uh, the depletion time scale could be different. If you perturb a galaxy, it's different. Now, we tried it with numerical simulations, 
But it turned out we need to put the depletion time scale in. We have to, when, when we do a numerical simulation of a, of a star forming galaxy, we have to fix the efficiency by which our gas turns into stars such that we get the right depletion time. It doesn't naturally come out. And I don't know of any numerical simulation where the depletion time is not a free parameter anymore or the efficiency by which you allow your gas to turn into stars. It is, I think, really, really interesting. And think of this, a depletion time of 10 to 9 years means an efficiency of star formation of a molecular cloud of 0.1%. 0.1% is nothing. It would mean that if the cloud immediately collapses, uh, let's say a 10 to 3 solar mass cloud collapses, it only can form one star of one solar mass. Uh, this seems a little, little, too little for me, even with feedback. So there's something really, really interesting going on. Maybe the clouds live longer than the collapse time scale, but then what keeps them up? And why should clouds at higher redshift also live 10 times longer, let's say, than the collapse time scale would be? And what is the collapse time scale in these clouds? Maybe it's much smaller even. So I think it's it's fascinating. Now, this is about global properties, but galaxies also have a kinematics. And with the, uh, with the observations, we now see the rotation curve of these high redshift galaxies or redshift two galaxies. There's a nice paper by Gensler et al. 2020 that uh, gives you a, an, an overview of the rotation curves you see. Now, as you all know, when you go to redshift zero galaxies, you get these flat rotation velocities. Well, you can work out um, what the gravitational forces which which you infer from the rotational velocity, just we rot square over the distance r. And uh, you can compare to what you know, and you all know if you take an exponential disk, uh, which, which has, a, 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 let's say, a half mass radius of order a few kiloparsec, then you would get the Keplerian de decline when you go outside of this half mass radius, because then you have most of the mass within the radius. So the disk would lead to a declining rotation curve. And so you need a dark halo, which becomes important in the other part, just to compensate for the decline in order to get something flat. What I do find interesting still, and I'm not 100% sure this has ever been worked out, is this conspiracy that when I, the, the rotation curve of the disk declines, the rotation curve that the dark halo has picked up such that at the end, you get something flat. Because you could imagine the disk's rotation curve to be very inward and the halo to be much more extended. And then you would get a, a, a decrease here and then going up again. And then you would know the transition from the disk to the halo. But if rotation curves we see, it's no, usually not seen, it's hidden. So somehow the scaling of the disk correlates with the scaling of the halo and um, in such a way that there is no dip. And I, I find this still a very interesting aspect of present day rotation curves. Now, how do the rotation curves of Redshift 2 galaxies look like? And here you get a sample of rotation curves which are extended enough so that we can go beyond the half mass radius. And these are just simply different rotation curves put together. What we did is we basically normalized the rotation to the maximum rotation and the radius to the, the radius where the maximum rotation occurs. So R over R max and V over V max. And then you see this kind of um, different rotation because they all seem to agree um, there is an increase, but this increase is not always there. One has to take into account that a few of these galaxies have massive bulges. And then actually the rotation curve would remain constant um, just move the slide again. Uh, but here the bulge has been taken out. So it basically only shows the disk contribution. You get the Freeman increase as you would expect. But what you find is in the outskirts, when you go beyond the maximum, the rotation is declining again. You can put it all together and then you get the shaded area over here. And that is something which is very different to present day galaxies. Look at the Milky Way the rotation curve remains constant. And it's something which is very hard to understand. It appears as if there is no dark matter 
leading to a constant hello, rotation. Hello, 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 hello. Yes? Hello? Okay, no, no, go on, Andy, go on. Okay, good. Uh, so we usually interpret these flat rotation curves by a positive dark matter. Now, you could say maybe dark matter is farther out, but there's another problem. This here is the Freeman disk. What you see here is the capillarian decline. This is if you assume that all the mass is in the inner region. And it is impossible for rotation to decline faster than the capillarian decline. But you see these observed disks rotate, uh, decline faster in rotation than Kepler which actually indicates something which is kind of negative dark matter. And when we first saw this, we, we hope that the air bars become so big that we can discuss it away, but we couldn't. And uh, so we were kind of a little puzzled how to explain it. Now, I think we have an explanation. And of course it solves this problem, but it leads yet to another puzzle. And so in order to motivate that, I need to look at something else. You can now take these rotation curves and you know the maximum rotation. And you also know the half mass radius of these galaxies. And then you can plot the maximum rotation where there's the half mass radius. The maximum rotation roughly is where the half mass radius uh, actually is, is sits. And you see there's of course a correlation. The larger the galaxy, also the more mass it has, the larger the maximum rotation which the galaxy has. It's very similar to the Tali Fisher relationship for present day galaxies. So, this is for the Redshift 2 galaxy sample we have. Now, you can compare this to present day galaxies. No, there's also maximum rotation. The rotation curve, however, declines a little bit and then stays flat, whereas in these Hydrogen galaxies, the rotation curve is declining. And if you look at the present day correlation of Virot versus R1 half, you find that they lie here along this line. So you might say, okay, that is similar. That's good. Somehow the high redshift galaxies mimic what we see for the low redshift galaxies with respect to the rotation scaling relations. But it is actually again a puzzle. Why is it a puzzle? Look, the present day galaxies lie along the upper edge. And the high redshift galaxies have smaller rotation on average and larger half mass radii for a given mass. And this is the opposite of what you would expect. Look, when you go to high redshifts, then you go to a more compact universe. At redshift two, the the size of the universe is a factor three smaller, the density is a factor 27 larger. And of course, the, everything, all the galaxies should be more compact. If they are more compact for the same mass, you would expect larger rotation. So you would expect the high redshift galaxies to lie here and not being more extended and rotating less than the redshift zero. So it's, it's going in the wrong direction. I would expect this line here, which is the range of zero, to lie here and not on the upper edge of this kind of distribution. So again, to some extent, counterintuitive. Now, what is the answer? Well, the answer is the random motion in the high range universe in galaxies. Here you see the velocity dispersion it is, if you look at the H alpha, it's actually what people call turbulence. I'm not 100% sure it's turbulence. It's random motion of the gas. And you could say, okay, H alpha is highly affected by feedback. It's hot gas. So there could be lots of random motion which mimics local effects and is not a global effect. But we also see it in the CO in general in these high redshift galaxies. So this is the random motion of the cold gas component. And as these stars are forming in currently in these high redshift galaxies, it's probably also the velocity dispersion of the, this young stellar population that is currently forming in these galaxies. And what you see is when you go to this high redshift sample, 
that the random motion is quite large. It lies between 40, 80, 90 kilometers a second. As you know, present day galaxies have a turbulence in the interstellar medium or random motion, which is a few kilometers a second. It's much smaller than what we find in the high redshift sample. And uh, that is, of course, very interesting when you compare it to the rotation. You know, you know random motion for present-day galaxies is negligible compared to rotation. So these, the present-day galaxies are completely dominated by centrifugal forces. But if you, when you put the random motion, you see the high redshift sample into this diagram, you see it's comparable uh, to the rotation we see. Galaxies have a rod over sigma, which is not 20. It is between four and eight, uh, six. Sometimes they are strongly rotationally supported, but often uh, the velocity dispersion is not negligible. And this has a strong effect on the shape and the rotation curve. And in order to show this, I want to do a little mathematical experiment. It's not very difficult to do. Uh, all we need to do is the hydrostatic equation again. The hydrostatic equation says that rotation as centrifugal forces V rot square over R must be compensated in an equilibrium by the gravitational forces of G. But in general, there's also another term which is usually connected when, when you look at rotation curves, which is the pressure gradient. 1 over rho dp over dr. And you see when the pressure declines outwards, it exerts a force that actually pushes outwards. And that partly compensates the gravitational force. So it's like a negative dark matter, a dark matter component that reduces the gravitational effects and by that also, in equilibrium, reduces the rotational velocities which we have. So it's exactly the term which we need to explain why the outskirts rotation velocities go down if the pressure becomes more and more important. And now what you can do is you now do a little experiment. You say the pressure is kinetic pressure, so it's rho times the velocity dispersion square. The gravitational force is just given by the material we have, dark matter and, and gas and stars. And we can uh, basically replace it by V rot square over R, where V zero square is now. Hey, hey. Yes. Uh, Hello. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you have. Nothing, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Please turn it off. Ah, yeah. So if. Um, if, if this V0 square is a rotational velocity, we would expect if pressure gradients would not be important. So this is basically in the case where the P over the ERR would be zero. Um, you put it into there and then you get this kind of equation. Now you have to get the gradient of the density. What we know is the surface density and we assume an exponential surface density. Uh, to get the density, we need to know the scale height, but the scale height is again a function of the velocity dispersion and the surface density. You can all put it together. Uh, this is the, the density which you get. You put it together. These details are not important. You can write all this, uh, look at, let's say, a paper which we wrote to attend about it. And then you find this formula for the rotational velocity, which the disk has to have in order to be in equilibrium. It's the rotational velocity square, which the disk would have if pressure effects are unimportant. But you see there's an additional term, minus two velocity dispersion square times R over RD. And you find very interestingly, when sigma becomes important, that this reduces the rotation curve. And you also see it is a strong function of the distance. So in the inner parts, where R is smaller than the disk scale length, it's unimportant. There we see the rotation we would expect just from gravity. But when you go to half mass radii beyond, half mass radius is 1.68 times the disk scale length, then this term becomes more and more important. Now there's even a factor two in it. So even if sigma is smaller than the rotation, because of the factor two, and especially when we go to radii much larger than the disk radius, this term begins to 
reduce the expected rotation. Now, uh, of course, it, this requires that the velocity dispersion remains constant. If the velocity dispersion declines too in the outskirts, then of course the effect might be negligible. But what the measurements show is that indeed sigma square is universal. It doesn't change with radius. It's also independent of inclination, which means sigma set and sigma xy are roughly the same. So this formula can be applied. So let's apply this formula to uh, the rotation curve of the redshift two galaxies. For that, we need, of course, a dark halo. And in this very simple toy model, I take an NFW halo. Um, as the galaxies we look at all we have similar real masses or the 10 to 12 solar mass. I take this as an example. Then I can work out from cosmology what the real radius is, let's say at redshift two or zero. And I can work out what we called the viral velocity, which is just the square root of g, the viral mass divided by the viral radius. And now I place an exponential disk into this dark halo. To some extent, I have a freedom on how big I make my disk. But uh, from the observations, we know the sizes of these disks roughly. And um, there are strong arguments also from cosmological simulation that the specific angular momentum of the disks, which is J disk over M disk, is correlating with uh, the, the, the specific angular momentum of the halo, which one can write as square root of two to R V times V V. And this ratio, which is dimensionless, which is called the disk lambda or spin parameter, uh, for many reasons, and I can't go into the details here, is of orders always 0 0.035 on average. It is not like this for individual galaxies, there's a big spread. Uh, it's not correlating well individually, but if you take the whole sample, then it's always of order 0 0.035. So if we know R vir, and if we know V vir, which we can get from our assumed M vir, we can work out what a specific angular momentum of our exponential disk has to be. We also need to fix the mass of the exponential disk and typical mass ratios, if we look at uh, uh, abundance matching and so on in these disks, but also the observations indicate something like 5%, the real mass. So if you take now this two, you can work out the rotation curve. And here's the example for redshift zero. Now, this assumes a certain half mass radius, which we have to choose such that we get the right specific angular momentum in this real hail of 10 to 12. And here you see the result. This is the expected rotation curve of our Freeman disk in this case. This is the expected rotation curve of the NFW halo. And if you put it all together, you get something very reasonable. You get rotational velocity of 220 kilometers a second, typical velocities of the Milky Way disk. And you get a flat rotation curve and the real radius and, and the half mass radius, uh, which comes out is, is of order four or five kiloparsec as expected. This is if you assume the velocity dispersion to be negligible small, and that is a, a good test. Now, when we go to redshift two and uh, then readjust the real radius, the real velocity, work out the angular momentum for the disk again, then get a disk scale length or disk radius, which is 2.1 kiloparsec. And because the disk is more compressed, a rotational velocity, which is larger. This is if we assume the velocity dispersion is negligible again. So indeed, when you go to higher redshift galaxies, this simple example shows that we would expect disks to be more compact and rotation to be higher than for low redshift galaxies. But as I told you, the observations show the opposite. So let's now increase the velocity dispersion. And when we increase the velocity dispersion, then you see from the equation up here, I have to move the bar again down, that of course, we need to readjust the rotation velocity. This is um, um, the velocity of the disk plus the dark matter, but we have to add this additional pressure term, which reduces the velocity of the disk. Now, the disk has to have a certain specific angular momentum. And when you reduce the rotational velocity because of the pressure term, you need to make your disk more extended. 
just for V rot times R, which are the angle of specific angle momentum, to not be different. And you see the effect is enormous. This was the rotation curve if velocity dispersion is negligible. If I assume a velocity dispersion of 60 kilometers a second, I get this here. And you see the maximum rotation is strongly reduced. You also see that the scale length becomes large. It's now actually larger than uh, for sigma equals zero and rotation is smaller. This is exactly what we observe. And you see the characteristic decline in the outskirts, just simply because here the velocity dispersion uh, term becomes more and more important. And so this explains very nicely uh, the observations. And indeed, you see the decline becomes steep and steeper. It is much more than Keplerian in the outskirts because Kep it's not, you know, it's uh, the pressure becomes more important. In fact, we can predict that these type of disks should have an outer cutoff. You know, if the dispersion is not changing, then there's a radius where we rot goes to zero because this term is basically compensating this both terms completely. So these this might have an outer cutoff un unless sigma changes, which we of course can't observe at the moment. So this explains very nicely the high redshift uh, galaxies. Okay, I don't want so. I think we have a fundamental understanding of the peculiarities of these high redshift galaxies. But we also learned that the kinematics is strongly dominated by the random motion. And the question, of course, arises, what is the origin of this random motion? And this is something that is highly debated. The idea is that these disks are highly gravitationally unstable because they have a lot of gas. And this has been studied a long time ago by Alla Toomrem. Um, uh, Alla is a wonderful person. Um, and of course, everybody knows him from his uh, 100 body simulations of galaxy mergers, galaxy interactions, which are still great. I mean, he got it all right, just with 100 particles. Uh, we now do what a billion particle cases, but it's not that much different to what he already predicted. And every should, everybody should have read his paper with his brother on galaxy mergers and formation of, um, of, of um, you know, spiral structures, tidal spiral structures, and so on. Uh, it, it's a wonderful paper. But Ella also did something else, which is very important. He worked out when galactic disks become gravitationally unstable. And this is called the tumor Q parameter, which is a product of the velocity dispersion, the disk times the shear, which is kappa, which is basically we wrote over R, divided by pi gravitational constant surface density. This term is the gravity term that makes the disk unstable. And this term contains the pressure, which stabilizes, and it, it, it contains the shear, which can also stabilize the disk against um, instabilities. And uh, what people argue is that galaxy disks will always adjust to a tuber parameter close to criticality, which means it's close to order unity. If the tumor Q becomes too large, let's say the velocity dispersion is too large, they are stabilized, but then there is no energy input into the disks. And so the to the random motion will dissipate and then uh, Q drops. And when the Q drops below one, the disk becomes unstable. And this instability generates um, um, basically dense regions. People argue it's already the potential energy which you release in the formation of these dense regions that uh, can drive sigma up again. I think this is complete garbage because the collapse never drives kinetic pressure or never generates a kinetic pressure. I think what happens is when you get an unstable disk, it can form stars. And the more unstable it is, the more crazy the star formation rate is. The depletion time goes down. And then the feedback drives sigma again up so that it gets close to, to the stable regime. It's not clear why star formation should keep it close to one. 
And that is, I, some, I think, something else which has yet to be worked out. But that's the idea that it's this self-regulation of crazy unstable disk, which makes sure the tumor queue is always of order unity. Now, what you can do is, you, if you fix your queue, you can work out what the lost dispersion of a disk has to be. That is very easy. The rotation velocity, we said, equal to gm over r. The velocity dispersion, we said, equal to the gas mass. Uh, the, the surface tension, we said, equal to the gas mass divided by pi, pi r square. We define a gas fraction, m gas, over dynamical delta. And then you can show that q boils down to this equation, it's square root of two divided by the gas fraction times sigma over v rot. And if you use this equation for present day galaxies, then you get exactly what we observe. The gas fraction is small for present day galaxies, 0 0.03. And then, uh, as I said, uh, sigma is, uh, you know, you solve for sigma is delta over square root of two times v rot. And you find for typical rotation velocities of 220 kilometers a second, eight kilometers a second, rather small. You can even work out the size of the gravitational unstable regions. That's the tumor length scale, which turns out to be delta times the disk radius, and it turns out to be 100 parsec. And if you look at how much mass you have in such a region, this is the cumulative mass scale, it's delta squared times m gas, you get to 10 to 6 solar masses. These are the most massive clouds. Now, when you apply it to the high redshift galaxies, delta is a factor 10 larger. And you see this, of course, because sigma goes proportional to delta, increases the velocity dispersion by a factor um, 10 or more. And to, so you see, basically, this explains why these high redshift galaxies have larger in the motion. It's just simply in order to keep them close to stability, they, this has to be introduced. The tumor length scale goes proportional delta, and you see now it's also large. It's now one kiloparsec. And the clump mass goes is even delta squared as delta. The gas fraction is a factor 10 larger. The clump masses become correspondingly larger. The gas mass is also larger, and you get clumps of order 10 to 9 solar masses. So in this very simple tumor picture, you can nicely explain how you get these kind of massive clumps. Now, this is being a simple idea. But of course, it has to be demonstrated and proven. And the problem which many people have is, and of course, we had this too, that the tumor instability is an instability which starts from an equilibrium. And you want to understand whether this becomes unstable. But once it's unstable, once it's highly nonlinear, the tumor criterion can't be applied anymore because it's an instability criteria, which just tells you something becoming unstable, but how it should look like, what the tumor length scales are on which things clump, what the tubal velocity dispersion should be, once it's unstable, can't be described by the tumor Q parameter. The Andreas, other problem, uh, yes? I want, I want to ask you something on this. Sure. Given the fact that once you have both gas and stars, this is a two fluid uh, yes. dynamics problem. And I, I remember a paper by Bruce Elmgren that said that the tumor criterion has to be modified when you had a two fluid situation, one collisionless and one uh, that has, uh, that is dissipative. Yes. So one should apply the, the tumor criterion in gas rich objects with stars, not in the original form, but having both fluids in. That is true. It is especially important for low redshift galaxies because there the, the stellar component has a larger scale height than the disk. And so it serves as a kind of stabilizing component. For the high redshift galaxies, we usually assume that the stars follow the gas mm -hmm. because they just form from the gas. So there is no difference between stellar component and gas component. And then you can show that basically you can treat both as one fluid. Only when the scale height or the velocity dispersion of the stars and the gas is different, do we have to take both separately into account. What we then have to do is one defines an, a new Q, which is uh, such that you say one over the new Q is one over Q stars plus, plus one over Q gas, where each of these Q stars and Q gas 
follows this kind of equation which we just had with the sigma stars and sigma gas, little sigma and big sigma and big uh, uh, stars and gas as before. Then you put it together. But that is only important um, if um, if stars and gas have different kinematics. Yeah, and uh, at, at, the, at the moment for the high range of galaxies, we treat them as one component because there's in our assumption, still follow the kinematics of the gas because they just recently formed from this component. But it may not be so because gas yes. is more dissipative than yes. stars and it may form different structures and different scale heights, even yes. at these high redshift objects. You're right. And that is something one should explore a little more. Now, um, absolutely correct. Um, we try to understand this instability more, especially run it into the nonlinear regime. The main problem which everybody had, and we also had, is that the tumor instability is an axisymmetric instability. It's not forming clumps, as we observe, it forms rings. And then the question is, what happens afterwards when these rings break up? Is there any large scale structure forming? And there's a simulation which was done by my colleague and friend, Manuel Behrendt, who is with, with me here in, in Munich. And you see here a gas disk, uh, which becomes gravitationally unstable. Tumor Q is below one. Uh, we set it up smoothly so that we can see how the rings form in the, due to the tumor instability. But then we see how the rings break up and what happens later on. And you can see the simulation here. As expected, the tumor instability happens first in the inner region. In fact, the rings which we get are precisely at the distances where we where this which agrees with the tumor length scale, and you see the outer rings then form later and later, but simply because surface density is smaller, it takes longer, and you see how the rings break up into individual clumps, and you can see that the inner region the clumps begin to gravitationally interact, they scatter, and the system breaks the axisymmetry, and you get a very complex system of molecular clouds. Now, in this case, I need to mention that we did not include feedback. So all the gas ends up into dense clumps. And at the end, there are no rings anymore. At the end, it's a messy system of lots of interacting, gravitationally interacting clumps. Uh, we then looked at this again. Um, and uh, of course, tracing the clumps better, you see how the clumps form in this kind of rotating disk situation in these you know, the rings you see here is where we would pre predict according to tumor instability uh, uh, for the rings to form and then they break up. And you see something else. You see that the clumps, these little points, are not randomly distributed in the disk. They begin to cluster. They form larger entities. They self-organize into larger entities. And in fact, and there is something very interesting, the sizes of these large entities are precisely what tumor would predict. They have sizes of a half a kiloparsec for this gas-rich galaxy, which means is redshift two, and they have masses of 10 to nine solar masses. So fascinating enough, despite the fact that the tumor instability is an axisymmetric instability and only an instability, it precisely predicts what the typical ensembles are that we form in this kind of experiment and which is also observed. Now, what you observe is not a clump cluster as we see here, you observe something smooth. And we were a little worried that maybe um, we predict here something which is not in agreement with the observations. And that's where Manuel uh, was very uh, was a genius. He said, okay, but observers have a problem. They don't have a resolution high enough to peek into each individual clump. So what happens if we smooth out our detailed clump distribution, which we observe, which we get in the simulations to a scale which is in agreement with the observations? So what we did here is we first inclined our disk which we generated. Uh, because our inclination to take into account inclination effects. And then we smoothed it to the resolution with the observers have. And when you do this, then you see all the substructure in this clump clusters disappear. 
And at the very end, when you get to a full with half maximum of all of the resolution, uh, the observations, you get five clumps in a ring. And this is very, very close to the observations. So what? why is it in a ring? Well, this is the half mass radius in an exponential disk. Most of the mass sits roughly at the half mass radius. That's why you get these kind of five clusters. So we would say the observers um, can't resolve these clumps. But if they would resolve the clumps, they would consist of lots of substructure, which is because they are just clusters of smaller cloudlets that are organizing themselves due to some um, effect, which I think we don't yet completely understand. It's a prediction which one can test. So I think we can reproduce what one observes. Now, one of the problems we had at that time is we didn't include feedback. And of course, when you include feedback, the problem arises that maybe all your clumps disappear and you don't form clump clusters and then it doesn't really look like the observations anymore. And so Manu in the, in, in, yeah, so that's basically what we predict. This is how uh, these massive clumps which are being observed should look like if one would have the resolution. And of course the question arises, what happens in these clump clusters? Do they form uh, uh, global clusters and how do they evolve? Now, so Manu in the last couple of years included feedback, it's rather tough because the surface, you know, the densities are very high. These are gas rich galaxies, including feedback has to be carefully uh, investigated where you let your supernova explode. Do they explode in the centers of these dense clumps? Do you let the system evolve before the supernova explodes? So these are questions that have to be done. And I just want to show a couple of results which are now being uh, written up. Here is the old simulation where we just let the disk become gravitationally unstable. You see all these clumps, and you see they organize into these clump clusters. The disk is very thin. And if you do this with feedback, then you get this result. It's the same gas fraction, the same rotational properties, just including stellar feedback by supernova blowing up the clumps. And you see, it looks at first a little different, but it has also some similarities to what we see before. You also see that the disk is now, if you look at it edge on, this is the edge on view, this is the face on view. The disk is much, much thicker. It is much more violent. You see, you get all these filaments being blown out into the outskirts of this kind of disk. So it's more complex. And of course, we were worried that maybe we don't see clump clusters anymore when we smooth it. So we smooth this image to the resolution. First of all, this is very nice. It shows you how the disk, this is an, an, an edge on view of the disk, how complex these kind of galactic disks must be at redshift two according to Manu simulation. So what we now did is we smoothed this to the resolution of the observers. And fascinatingly enough, also you can't really see it here. When you smooth it, then you get again get clump clusters. Uh, you get clumps, massive clumps, regions where star formation happens, uh, so to say, um, enhanced star formation happens, very similar to the observations again. So it's the same as before. The fact that with smoothing, you get these kind of mark, uh, 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 marked points of star formation hasn't disappeared. Now, Andreas, also, a small remark. Yes? Uh, regarding feedback, uh, this is uh, something to keep in mind that this is not just mechanical. A great deal of feedback is what I call thermodynamic feedback. That means you keep the gas warm via radiation. It's not forming an H2. Uh, you arrest the development of any further stars without any big, big blow or big explosion. Simply by putting it in a thermal state that is not conducive to star formation. And this is very important in low metallicity systems because it will actually keep the gas hot and it will not blow out. It will still make it incapable of forming stars. If this is not often taken into account, the thermal aspect of feedback, yes. because it doesn't have explosions, I guess. Yeah, but there is yeah, absolutely right. And in fact, this is something Manu has done right now. He looked at, he has also UV background feed 
the feedback through UV background and so on. And they found that these galaxies have a large H1 component, mm -hmm. a diffuse H1 component, which has a substantial amount of gas and mass, which observers usually forget because the redshift you don't see it. So they just think everything is molecular and they forget that actually the gas mass is much more because of this H1 component. Not only that, so we, there's going to yeah. be the destruction of CO by both cosmic rays and far UV, so ah, you have H2, yeah. which is not marked by CO, and that will also be not forming any stars. It will be part of this component, which is inefficient. Great. I mean, this is something that needs to be explored in greater details, because one of the problems is the high redshift gas fraction or baryon fraction we, we assume from the observation is similar to the higher to the low redshift baryon fraction mm -hmm. which is again unlikely because the galaxies are young they haven't yet blown everything out and bringing the baryon fraction up would be important and so if you have a hidden gas component which has a substantial amount of mass it would be very very important to understand more very good thank you very much for the uh, for, for the hint so we see this already, but of course we haven't put in all the, these great details, uh, which which are uh, essential. But Manu works on that, and of course, if you have an interest in that, we can. I would think we can maybe collaborate a little bit, at least talk to each other, if sure. you like. Yeah, yeah, great. Awesome, so, thanks. what you also see in these more sophisticated simulations is, in addition to the clumps, you see these kind of filamentary structures which are just result of the turbulence you generate. The question was, if you have higher resolution of the high redshift, do you also see it? And indeed, in the very recent paper by Gensel 23, you see the clumps and you see these filaments. And th like this, now the, there's something very important and we are not the expert, that's why we need uh, the Athens group, especially Bano and, uh, and uh, the people working on orbital structure. You could interpret these filaments as spiral arms. But these filaments we see in the simulations are not spiral arms. They are not density waves. They are just a result of filamentary turbulence in the shear environment. And I would like to understand, is this here the same as this? Or are these really spiral arms? My question would be for you, if I have a, re, a, a galaxy which has a large dispersion, let's say 20% rotation, is it actually possible for spiral arms to form at all? Uh, you know, because they might need very cold disks. Maybe spiral arms can never form in high dispersion galactic disks. If that you can, if you can demonstrate that, then we know that these disks are not, uh, these are not spiral arms. Maybe these are maybe these kind of structures, which we also now get in the numerical simulations. That would be interesting. So I'm already an hour into the talk, so I would like to summarize very quickly. I think the high redshift, redshift 2, this galaxy, we now have redshift 10 galaxies. Everybody jumps to redshift 10. We haven't yet figured out redshift 2. Uh, well, OK, so I stay with redshift 2 at the moment. Um, are, as we observe, as expected, gas rich with high star formation rates, we can explain it by a strong gas gas secretion, which then leads to the high star formation rate just simply because it mimics the accretion rate. Uh, and it, the gas mass is high simply because uh, the accretion rate is high and the depletion time is very long. And why the depletion time is very long, even in the high range of the universe, is for me one of the biggest proper puzzles, which we don't understand. We have seen that the high redshift galaxies are highly crumbly and strongly perturbed. And um, we, this is something uh, we would expect indeed from gravitational instability due to the Q, to the Q uh, criterion. But there's another puzzle, which is that if you have a highly perturbed disk, then according to manual simulations, the disks, if you look at them, edge on should be quite thick. It's just simply, again, hydrostatic. But the observers do not see a high scale height. For the observers, the scale heights are always with or below the resolution, which is a few hundred parsecs. 
But what we expect is a scale height which is much larger than a few hundred parsecs, especially in the outskirts where the surface density goes down, the scale height should, should flare, you know? If the loss dispersion is constant, then the scale height goes as one over the surface density. The surface density declines exponentially, you would expect the scale height to increase exponentially. And that is not observed in any uh, of these kind of disks, which are seen almost edge on. And this is a puzzle by itself, which you can't explain. And finally, there's of course the puzzle with these features, which you now begin to resolve in the observations. Do are they spiral arms? Or can, can, can they be just turbulent large scale flows um, as we observe? as we find in the numerical simulation. The final, the most interesting part is, is what happens in these dense regions of star formations, massive regions of star formation. We can't really solve them in great details in the numerical simulations. We don't have the physics to explore them in details, but could they be the seeds for globular clusters? And maybe more important even, could they be the seeds for the supermassive black holes by efficient star formation locally, and then everything merging, which then spiral into the center and form uh, the central AGNs, which we later on see in present day galaxies. What I would like to end up with, with, with a question I always wanted to understand, you know, we started with the Hubble sequence of redshift zero. We now see these redshift two disk galaxies, but connecting them to the Hubble sequence is still for me, not well understood. You know, it's clear that these redshift two disk galaxies cannot form spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, simply because the stars form which high, with high random motion and uh, of 40, 50, 60 kilometers a second, but the stars in the Milky Way have a random motion of only 10, 20 kilometers a second. So this is too small and you can never really cool a stellar system. So they can't form the present day spiral galaxies. Do they form present-day elliptical galaxies? And what are the progenitors of the present-day Milky Ways at Redshift 2? This is one of the questions which are still open and not explained. And with this, I would like to stop and thank you for listening. Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Andy, for the great talk, very interesting. Let me try first here to uh, change the view option so that we see also the people that may be participating to the uh, so here I go down and there here so that's better okay yeah okay okay uh, well we uh, may start uh, uh, questions from the audience here if there are just let me uh, clarify something. So when we see this uh, six kiloparsecs uh, early uh, universe galaxy, there is also a stellar underground component, right? Which has yes. a morphology. And I guess yes. uh, the masses of the two components are at least comparable or the, the gas dominates? You know, the gas fraction, yeah, roughly 50-50. So in most cases, it's similar masses in stars and gas. Uh, roughly the ring area is about where half mass radius uh, uh, is. Right. Yeah, I would say in the ring, there might be more gas than than there are stars. But on average, on you average. often have also bulge component. And also in the inner region, in the inner regions are dominated by the stars. And the ring is a transition to where the gas begins to dominate. You know, this inside out star formation. Uh, so I would say the outskirts are dominated by the gas. The in innermost region are dominated mostly also by stars. Okay. But the total gas fr mass fraction is roughly 50 50. Okay. Okay. So let me see. Are there any questions here at the audience? If not, then we go. I see Padelis has already his uh, hand ra raised, so... Ask. Maybe somebody else should, should go ahead first because I already abused some of the time and you can put me last. I'm okay with that. <laughs> hey, uh, I see you there, so please go ahead and I'm checking if there are more. All right, okay. All right, Andreas, I'm going to have uh, two remarks here. Uh, actually, one remark, one critique. Uh, regarding the galaxy simulations, we have done with the Leiden group 
simulation where you don't put the depletion time scale in by hand. We actually mm -hmm. use this uh, kind of neglected ISM thermodynamics, and we simply say, we're going to track the H to H to phase transition. We had the resolution for dwarfs back then. That was 2007, mm -hmm. no, 2008, 2009. So we simply say we're going to track the H to H2 transition. At the moment you have an H2, you can form stars at a constant efficiency from the H2 alone. And this beautifully self-regulated without any depletion time scales in. So I, I can send the uh -huh. reference. Yes, please do. So this is so it's a, but but the efficient you've put an efficiency in, isn't it? <clears throat> the, the efficiency will be after H2 formed, and it will be the local the, the local galactic efficiency. And actually, you could even uh, make it a little bit better, say only the CO bright H2 has the cooling properties to collapse genes locally and form stars yeah. in unresolvable scales. So the CO rich H2 only form stars is an additional superimposed criterion on the, on the H to H2 phase transition uh, yeah. as a regulator of, of star formation yeah. galaxies. I'll send that to you yes. because it's, it's a side issue. Yes, please do. What, did you also try gas rich galaxies like the Redshift 2 to see yes. what you Well, get no, there? because you see, this was back in 2008 and, and, and yeah. 9 when mm -hmm. the computation capabilities were as advanced and, and the whole hula baloo about high rate of galaxies was still premature. Yep. So now I'm going to have to say that this is going to be recognize the difficulty of these measurements, but I will have to dispute some of the core results. Mm -hmm. With another group headed by Federico Lely, we simply mm -hmm. don't reproduce the high turbulence flat rotation curves of the very galaxies that were in Reinhardt's nature paper. When mm -hmm. after that, reanalyze the H alpha data, put CO4 to 3, CO3 to 2, and carbon, and we found the flat rotation curve, no high turbulence, you know, no, no high pressure term, as you say. Everything looked normal in that respect. And mm -hmm. this is important. And the only thing I have to say is that if I were to put it in a laconic way, not so fast. It's beautiful. The, 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 the whole story you showed is really nice and elegant if it holds. But I think we are too fast in actually talking about the dynamical stage of high redshift galaxies. Mm -hmm. And if you can, yes. Reinhard, Reinhard knows this critique of mine, but you can mm -hmm. remind also, I will remind you a lesson which we learned early, but is not widespread in the community. Back in 1996, 97, we thought that we were detecting all the gas there is in the high rate of universe using the Plateau de Bure. We're looking at transitions, CO4 to 3 and higher, excited gas. Mm -hmm. We could not do any better because that's the instrument we had. There was a big dispute back then that there is no more gas in galaxies. The CO4 to 3 emitting gas is all there is, warm and dense. We told them back then, not so fast. Let us see with the VLA to go to mm -hmm. low J transitions, less biased to start forming sites, which yeah. will give us a cleaner dynamical picture of the totality of the gas. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, they, we went to the VLA, they also went to the VLA, and they found that there's 10 times more gas than what the Plateau de Bure was saying, even though they mm -hmm. were strongly saying that's all there is. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to repeat. Unless we look at the low J lines, we are picking preferentially the star-forming sites, and feedback is injecting turbulence and dispersion. We have yep. to look at CO1 to 0 and 2 to 1 in these disks, and repeat the analysis just to see whether we are mm -hmm. in the right or or right hard and you guys are in the right in terms yes. of yes no it's very I good it's it. very important I, I this is something of course for a theorist we have to take whatever data we get from the observers but it would be interesting to see whether the gas in between the star forming region is much more quiescent exactly uh, like this that, that would be lovely and how much can, gas it is. Yeah. You can say that back to Linda and to Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. If I were to mm -hmm. take the Milky Way, I'll put it face on and I'm going to map it only CO4 to 3 higher. Would mm -hmm. you take, would you have this dynamic state that the low transitions and hydrogen gives us? The answer is no. You'll be getting mm -hmm. the galactic center, a few clumps 
and only clumps where there will be the star forming regions in Orion. And that would be all that appears in your high redshift image. And mm -hmm. that would be very biased image, both dynamically and in terms of the total molecular gas reservoir. Mm -hmm. I heard, of course, Linda and, and, and Brian, we talk about this all the time because they are aware of this kind of controversy and, of course, of the, the complexity. But they have also these CO observations and they tell me they also show a uh, high dispersion. Yeah, but the high J ones, the high J lines. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. See, mm -hmm. from CO4 to 3 and high, we actually look at star forming region gas and only mm -hmm. that. The rest of the gas is too cold to diffuse the excite the, 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 mm -hmm. the gas, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Kobe satellite early image, you will see how our galaxy looks on CO4 to 3. It looks like a clump in the center and a couple of clumps mm -hmm. around. The rest mm -hmm. is invisible in the high J transitions because it's not warm and dense enough to, to excite them. Only star forming yep. regions can do that. I understand. Very, very interesting. It's also something for our numerical simulations. We could actually measure deliberately the star forming regions, the high irregular motion we expect, but maybe in between it's much more quiescent too, which would yes. be consistent with, with what, you, what you see. And, and please send us the reference. Just we, we, I know about you, of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, we, 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 we know about this, but anyway, send whatever you still have. Yeah, Federico, it, it's only papers. one work. It's only one work where we went and took exactly the, the uh, galaxy of the Nature paper, reanalyzed the H-alpha data, and put yeah. our own CO4 to 3. But the lead author is Lely, Federico, yeah. who is at ESO at that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. I am part of the group, but further down. Very so I'm good. going to send you this together with, Thank you. Uh, with the galaxy simulation we're talking about. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, I see uh, also Zimos Kazanas wants to ask something. Zimos? Yes, uh, one very quick question. Uh, where does the high turbulence come from? Is from the accretion of gas becomes yeah. turbulent? That's why you have look, high turbulence. Look, yeah, Demos, this is indeed a big controversy I have with Mark Humboldt. So what, and also Avishai Dekel. So what they say is the, the instability feeds itself. They say you get a gravitational instability, and then the instability generates a random motion. The random motion increases the loss dispersion, and then the instability shuts itself down. Look, and to me, this is we have we have a little story in Germany, which is uh, Baron Münchhausen. You haven't heard of it. This is a yes, guy. Yes, of who course, I've heard him. <laughs> yeah, and the, the I've guy who violates <laughs> physics, so he gets into it is a swamp and then he tears himself out on his own hair. Yeah? Yes. And this is what I think that, that this instability does. You know, it is not, if you have an instability, everything is collapsing into clumps. You cannot stop the collapse by the collapse itself. You know, the potential energy you release doesn't go into pressure, into random motion. Yes. It goes into radial inflow. So an instability needs to be stopped by an external mechanism. And the only one I know is feedback. So it's not not the radial flow through the disks or whatever. Do I know potential energy released by any way, by anything? This all must be the feedback. And uh, otherwise, yes. And of course, whether we have enough feedback, given the star formation rates, is the key. Yeah. And if we don't have it, and it must be feedback, then it is indeed uh, what we just discussed. Then the, maybe the loss dispersion isn't that high. Because they have, if you have less velocity dispersion, you have less dissipation rates, you don't need less feedback. So these are interesting questions, but it's all a big discussion at the moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? I don't see. If someone wants to ask and I don't see, please go ahead and speak. I don't think so. So I think the, 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 the big questions are those that are at the end of uh, the projected slides. What are the today's counterparts of the <laughs> Z equal to galaxies and uh, the connection with ga Milky Way type galaxies today? It's a big oh, Could I ask a question there, Pat? Oh, please, Leah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, it's not at all my field, so it might be stupid. But anyway, um, you are worried about the formation, the link between the Z equals two disks and the today's disk, and you come out with the, the, the rather pessimistic view. 
But I wanted to ask, what about the circumgalactic medium? Do you put that in in any way or not? Not in these isolated simul. You mean in the simulations? We we yes. didn't put the circumgalactic medium in. We had we created some gas in the disks by just simply increasing the mass of our our, our gas uh, density, increasing it. But but uh, the problem is with the circumgalactic medium put in. If you take the cosmic web into account, you do not get the resolution to resolve the disk instability correctly. This is, you know, the old story that this disk scale height is extremely important to get the instability, but the scale height is so tiny in the disks that if you take cosmology into account, you, you don't have many resolution elements. That's, yeah, that's one of the issues one has to deal with. But then you should perhaps lower your... Um the sound of what you're saying, because, you know, you need to put the circumgalactic medium or something yeah. that could be the circum. I tried it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I found that it was day and night with and without. Yeah. Well, so... Leah, it is, Leah, it is in self consistently. I showed yes. you this, you showed, I showed you this highly turbulent disc, you know, the, the edge on view. Yes. And so the disc generates its own circumgalactic medium, of course, you know, by the, by all these bursts and so on. So there is a pressure generated, a hot bubble pre pre generated by the disk itself. So it's like an equilibrium. It's like a, a glass of water where you put a lid on and then of course you generate the pressure on top of the water. That's what the disk, also our disk does. But we do not have any feedback. We don't have the inflow of cosmic yes, web yeah. gas. Okay. But the right. circumgalactic medium is self-consistently forming in these galaxy simulation with feedback. Okay, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then uh, I think we could uh, stop here. Thank you, Andy, very much again. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, I enjoyed it. Be in contact in a while. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yes, yeah. now go to your cake. <laughs> yeah, it's time for the cake, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you much. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 b